massive goal square. He is, he looks. Oh, he's he's holding holding the right knee. This does not look good for Alex Rands. You don't want, don't want to say what that looks like, but that looks done. Let's good hope it's not what it could be. That is generally where players are going to grab when, when it's an ACL type injury. Real concerns here for the Richmond Tigers. The only player in the competition to be named an All Australian over the last five years. He's the most important player in the team. What a story this could turn out to be. So the competition loses one of its stars for the season, and Richmond is without the defender of the generation. Damien Hardwick, welcome to AFL 360. Thank you, Jared. Robo. Chris Hello. Scott, hello. Thank you. Good to be back. Um, take us inside the coach's box on <laughs> Thursday night. Yeah, it was tough. Obviously, it was one of those ones where he went down and it sort of, it didn't look that bad, but then as soon as it didn't look that bad, you automatically fear the worst because for Alex to stay down that long and it was that innocuous type of incident where you're thinking, this doesn't look good. Um, and then it was the, the shuffling of the magnets, like as, as harsh as it is for a coach, you're obviously disappointed to lose one of the greatest players we've seen. <laughs> Um, but then it started to, well, plan B, how do we fix this? How do we wreck the fight? And, you know, then the word came through, they're 99% sure it's an ACL and the disappointment was there. And, you know, how do we feel the, the sympathy with regard to the group but also keep the group focused on the task at hand? And yeah, it's pretty tough. How overall. did you feel personally when it came through that 99% it would be an ACL? Oh, it was incredibly disappointing because, you know, you think about the way this guy plays the game and for, for such an incident such as that to bring about his downfall, it's like this guy's Hercules. You know, the way he throws in around his body and the things that he can do was in incredibly disappointing. But, you know, he's such a selfless person. The way he's been around the club has just been incredible. The way he spoke after the, oh. after the game was quite incredible, actually. Yeah, it made me feel guilty. I was feeling <laughs> sorry, sorry for him. But, um, can I ask you, Demo? Away from the, the Thursday night, it's been Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Did you do you go around to his house? Do you go and speak to him, and, and sit down with him just as a bloke to a bloke, not a coach to a, to a player, and just talk about life or not? Yeah, well, he was in the next day. Was he really, that, Alex? He's that sort of that sort of person, and, and and Jack tells a great story how he dropped around a, a present for for his child, which was incredible as well. And you know, that's the sort of guy he is. You know, his footy club is his life, is his family, and. Yeah, we, we spoke and I'm sort of thinking about, you know, the things that he can do, but he's well and truly entrenched and wants to help the boys become what they need to be. So, you know, he's probably helping me along the way a little bit. I was feeling a little bit sorry for myself, a few sleepless nights thinking how are we going to replace this guy, but he's been incredible. Which is, when it comes to coaching, like, you've coached them when they've all been there and now you've got to coach a team without one of the pillars there. It's probably something new to you as a coach, even though you've coached for a long time. Is there a natural answer to it, or do you actually sit down and talk to people and say, right, this is how we're going to approach it mentally with the players? Yeah, we did. We, we spoke about, um, obviously, the, the loss of Alex. And Alex is irreplaceable, let's be honest. You know, mm. we, we cannot replace, he's that good a player that you just can't slot another player in. And then we sort of spoke as a group, it's up to 22 of us to fulfil the, the role of him. Um, we're not expecting one player to come in and be able to get close to what, what that player can represent. And, you know, it's an opportunity for us as a team to, to find another way. You know, it's an opportunity for us to find another player and, you know, we've all gone through it and we'll go through it again at some stage, no doubt. It was really interesting to hear some of the grand final footage from last year and I think it was Nathan Vardy talking about... Might not, but they were talking about Nathan Vardy mm. when Natanui went down yep. and Adam Simpson almost seemed a bit callous in his approach. So, right, Natanui's out. Vards, you're in. We've just got to do the job. Now... We know that's a little bit of an act because Simo must have been really hurting inside, but the that's message the way to the players, yeah, yeah, and it's you know, just trying to find that balance because I think um, you know what you've built over the last couple of years, at least from the outside, looks like a really galvanised group, and, and all good teams really care for each other, but you have to move on. Yeah, that's just the harsh reality of it. Will you use him? Oh, he he want to be used. Have you found a role or thought about a role? <laughs> I just imagine Alex, the type of guy, he'll be rocking up in his Tommy Hafey yeah. kit, I reckon, with his <laughs> and, and all that sort of stuff. So he goes in for his operation tomorrow, um, and then we'll sit down and... Do you, you want him? Do you want him to play oh, a role? Got, uh, it'd be crazy for us not to. You know, he's an incredible player, and, you know, with the knowledge of the way he plays the game, we've got some young defenders we feel will be, be very good. And, you know, Scotty's obviously got Matthew Scarlett down 
at his mm. club as well, and, and those players are you know generational. They, they don't come around that often. So whatever knowledge he can impart on their players is, is a good thing. Strategically, so the mid-season draft, the data set, it's down the track. It, will you start to do a bit of planning around bringing an extra player in? Yeah, we did speak uh, a little bit about that, but we feel in that position we've got enough depth at the moment, enough young talent coming through. So once again, that'll be a decision that that goes along the way. It's funny, you know, if it happened seven days early, we'd probably get the opportunity to bring in another player and we would, would if we? Well, yeah, not too sure. Probably, though. Possibly, yeah. So not too sure, possibly. <laughs> no, probably, no, no. Maybe. <laughs> I wish I wasn't talking about it, to be honest, but anyway. Do you two know each other how well? Is it just through coaches, as competitors, combatants? You not, too? Uh, not, not as, not really? as well as probably we should. We, we mm. played against each other. We're not dissimilar in age. We've been coaching for about the same period of time. Weren't too dissimilar as hotheads on the field. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. skipped you skip the best bit. Had run oh, on the field? Uh, oh, hang on. Who haven't you had run-ins? Well, I think we both would have had run-ins in the field. Yeah. 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 Oh, oh. Was that a flop? Brad. Yeah, it was Brad or Chris. <laughs> Who was that? Brad. <laughs> That was a fiery day. What do you remember of it, Dimmit? Oh, all I remember is Choco tried to get me to uh, smash Nigel Lappin. I think Nigel might have had some ribs or something. He that, did. That day, was he that did. right? And, yeah. Uh, he went into the grand final with ribs, ribs from the prelim. I can't remember. Yeah, Wasn't that was it? in a yeah. Collingwood game, but yeah. he played sore a bit. Yeah. Yeah, take this off. Are you connected to the sense where you'd talk about Collingwood with with Chris and I just upstairs around the around the kitchen table. Uh, would you, if Chris asked you a question about Collingwood, would uh, you offer your? I think expertise? we would, but I think we were talking about this the other night at our, our coaches dinner. I think the relationship between the coaches is now, it's it, it's it's evolved over you know six or seven years. We've become more. I say diplomatic is probably not not a great word choice, but more open about conversations. Not so much about us versus them and them versus mm. us, but just in the, about the game in general, I think, has become... Yeah, and I think a bit more empathetic too. Yeah. And I think the longer you're in the game, you realise that sometimes you can be doing a pretty good job and things go against you and, and vice versa. Mm. Um, in terms of sharing information around um, between clubs, I'm not sure that happens that much. I mean, I've got a unique situation in the competition at the moment when one of the coaches um, is my twin brother and we don't really talk much about the, the other teams. Um, and I think I've said this before, generally, sometimes the information can actually be a bit destabilising. Most of the time, especially when you're a good team like Richmond, you're probably better off concentrating on what makes you a good side. If you try Mine's to... Mine's destabilising. Mine. Well, I think if you try to... Um, let's say, for example, if we had a look at... Um, and clearly we'll have a really strong look at the way Port Adelaide played Melbourne. But if we think, right, let's just do that, we're going away from what makes us a good team and we end up a little bit in between. Okay. Um, but I also think there's an element of respect, or I know there is. Um, so if, um, if I'm talking to Dimmer about um, Collingwood, um, I, don't, I just don't really think that's fair. That's not the way we operate, is it? It's, um, there, and there is a bit of a Hawthorne click around the coaching fraternity at the moment. Maybe they no, walking. You haven't noticed that? <laughs> well, it has occurred to me a couple of times. They're the ones who want the runners. <laughs> uh, I think that one's pretty unanimous, that one. But um, yeah, I, th I think there's just such respect that, you know, we, you know, I, I look around the competition now and I, I don't see one coach where I think, well, you know, he's just he's just feeling his way they all know what they're doing so mm. they don't need a leg up from us round one's unique and it offers the chance to grow belief so you got that through debutants we're just looking back through the last three years in 2017 you played a couple 18 you played three this year you went and played four what's it worth um, when you get a, a critical mass of youngsters into a into a team for the first time and that's pretty bold to play for port adelaide did it as well and you get the result from it yeah, and even, I think it was 2017, we ended up playing eight debutantes uh, in that yeah. season. Uh, and look, it, it's a lot of coaching moves. When it works, it's really galvanising <laughs> and, and, and you, know, you can look really clever, but we've been at slightly different, um, at slightly different spots in our evolution um, where we've really sort of forced a few young players in. We don't really feel like we're in that position at the moment. We've, we play 10 players under 50 games again. We did that consistently last year, even, even 12 and 13 at times. We're playing the best team we can. Just happened to be four first gamers and two guys from other clubs who were playing their first game from Geelong. 
Um, but it is. A, there's no doubt that we went into the game thinking, is this too many against a, a really good team? So there's some short-term validation there. But, um, you know, I, I think all those guys played well enough to think they'd like their chances of, of playing um, in the Geelong team the next couple of weeks. Um, Max Gorn, the challenges that he faces. So the thought was this happened in the preliminary final. West Coast went at him physically. Port Adelaide, with a preconceived plan, went at him. Mm. Is that... Is that the evolution of a top-line player that now he can expect that routinely? He's got to work his way through it? I think so, and I think it's probably a little bit diff different. It's probably, the, you know, from a ruck point of view, but guys like you know, Dustin and Danger and Selwood and these type of players, they probably get that on a weekly weekly basis. Probably not to the level of, of some of this stuff here, but obviously the ruckman, having the one ruckman getting in his way, taking energy, the first quarter it might not up, second quarter, but by third and fourth, you know, you wrestle for a period of time, it's going to take its toll. Do you think? Do you think it's a tactic that will be quite prevalent this year, or do you both think that no, this is not in the spirit of the game anymore? This happens just happen all the time. Mm -hmm. This is no longer in the spirit of the game, or do you believe, hey, this is footy? You go out there, you've got to get, you've got to take everything that comes at you. Yeah, I think there's a degree of it that is within the, the spirit of the game, but then there's stuff that's outside, like the knocking him off the ball and knocking him down. I think that's where the umpire can probably stay in. And you know, our understanding, if he didn't know about in the back, it's probably a free kick, um, especially forceful nature like that. So, look, I think the umpires will look at it and think they probably missed a few. Um, we still want to allow the great players to play. There's a, there's a part in the game that we want to you know, be able to disrupt, distract and all those sort of things. But you still want to see the, the Jets, you know, the Martins, the Dangerfields being able to play the game. If Martin was taken off the ball like Gorn was, would you contact the AFL, the umpire's department? And the same with Joel and Gaz and Paddy. Would you contact them? Well, I'd hope they'd be probably contacting me, <laughs> to be fair, to say, listen, we missed that one. Um, I think that's an area we can both get better from a proactive communication point of view about, listen, these things... We did well, like we do in, you know, our game, and move on. I've watched the game pretty closely. I, the, the one where Gorn went down, he got a free kick for that. And Jonah's got a $2,000 fine for that today. Yeah, so I think sometimes we can say, is that outside the spirit of the game? And you can say emphatically yes, because everyone's agreed. The umpire, the MR, mm. MRO. Uh, but I, I think there's a lot of other things that mm. um, where free kicks weren't paid, where it's probably play on, and there'll be a few ground-level midfielders thinking... <laughs> Welcome to our world. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> First impressions of the rules on Coaches Night coming up shortly after 360 Couch. Paul Ruse, Gary Lyon, Jonathan Brown and Jared Healy provide all the analysis and insights into round one. Brought to you by Jack's Tyres. The opportunity is large here for O'Meara. Had 50 metres to cover and the silence of the crowd said it all. Kelly handball through. Here's number 500 for the Hawk. Yes, please. Durando's been terrific. Puts it on the outside of the boot and gets a goal. Inside 50, Harris! Heaney! Oh, what a trap! Across to Boke, who just wobbles one forward, and it's good enough, he's put it through. A little gift from Stevie Lee Thompson, Ebony Marriott, on the left, gets the first for the Crows. Cameron's quick, working hard, he controlled it brilliantly! McCarthy wants five! in the weekend encore. Okay, let's snapshot of, of the rule. So one that didn't change, so the sliding rule which has morphed into contact below the knees, is this, so you're big on this, nice. um, Good. is this not being adjudicated in the manner that it was initially intended? Oh, it was dangerous. I think that's a good summary of where we're at. And I think the AFL have moved to clarify it this afternoon or, well, we certainly, um, that was the incident that we, um, asked about and they've admitted that that was a mistake and that they'll send out some clarification. I think Patrick I Dangerfield like said 
players are pretty good at milking mm. these sort of things and we've got to the stage where the initial intention of the rule isn't what's being officiated at the moment or, or, the, or that's certainly not the interpretation that we're seeing. So what did the AFL, did you get a memo from the AFL today about this or not? Do you know, Jimmy? Not that I've seen. Okay. So it might have just been a joke. But do you think you agree with Chris that there's a little bit of confusion? Yeah, I think so. And I think, once again, the, the umpires, like the players, are maybe a little bit rusty at this stage. Yeah. So I think it'll be... I think it'll be sorted out. So I think there's a couple in that that were probably thinking, well, that's probably a mistake. So if we used what was dangerous as a cue, there seemed to be one in the Essendon Giants match, um, Anthony McDonald, Tip and Woody, where there actually is sort of velocity uh, in the way that that unfolds. Is that that's knee or ankle, depending on how high or low that. And that that sort of feels like that was the intention of the rule to pay a free kick for that one and take that action out. And I think he was saved. Was it Williams there? Sorry, I didn't see a good look at that. It was, mm, I, I think he was saved by his approach to the footy. If he had really stood up to his full height and um, Tip and Woody got him below the knees there, that would have that would have been really dangerous. So I think we've got to be really careful at looking at incidents and saying that's not a free kick, especially when the umpire say, "Yeah, you're right. That shouldn't be a free kick," but. The rule is forceful contact below the knees. So when a guy's going hands first and gets his hands on the footy first and someone trips over him, that, that, that they're not the situations we're talking about. We're talking about sliding feet first or mm. really going low like Tip and Woody and yeah. taking out someone's feet. Did you, um, did, were you surprised or with your tactics or did you put in tactics for 666? There was a lot of graphics about your movement. On Thursday night or in the replay I saw you were doing this or they were explaining you were doing this. <laughs> It seems like you're just sending a player back. To, you're sending an extra player back after it'll get there in about 15 seconds. Yeah. That's what it seemed like. Oh, we, we tried some things. There's no doubt about that. We wanted to have a look at some situations, and you know, the, it is hard to, to get a, an idea of what's going to work and what's not going to work. Um, so we got some more more information. Uh, whether we go with it again, we're not not too sure because once again there was a situation where one of our players changed a call on the field and we are going bunter in the box trying to figure out what's going on, but we couldn't send the runner around because we didn't know what was going on. So, uh, But these are the things that we're, we're still finding out ourselves. There were rapid-fire goals out of the middle. So, so far, there's no increase in scoring. In fact, there's a significant reduction in round one scoring, but you both experienced sort of those rapid-fire goals which served you well, you in the last quarter and yours in the first quarter. Mm. I think I heard Scott Penderbury put it well. They were a goal up and he thought that the 666 rule was rubbish and they needed players behind the ball and then they ended up a goal down and it was a fantastic rule. <laughs> and that's where we're going to be throughout the course of the season. Um, I mean, I'm an advocate for it. I know my view is that the changes to the game shouldn't be judged on scoring alone. That was never really the charter to increase scoring. Now, having said that, I think scoring shots were up over the weekend. Yeah, they were. If, they were. And we were one of the main culprits, missing from missing 25 some. out in front. The rule makers can't do much about, what about that. Um, what about the long kicks from the forward line guys? And you both would have been playing when this was happening. We just saw Callum Brown from front and square turn around, screw around his shoulder. That was a great moment for that young kid. And it was like pure footy. You kick it long to the big boys. One of them doesn't mark it. Get your smalls under. Rove, gather, kick the goal. Do you like that aspect of it? Do you even think about that sort of stuff? Or do you think, where was he? Where was he standing <laughs> on him? Et cetera, et cetera. Well, I think the strategy from that one is we're probably very much like 17 other clubs is just get it in long and deep from the centre bounce as much as you can. And I was quite fascinated by the commentary. It's like there's never been a centre bounce goal kicked <laughs> in the history of the game. <laughs> Everything's related to the 666. I found it quite funny. Steve Hocking, take him down. I'm like, out loud. We have kicked these goals before. Let me just say, so were you kicking longer, deeper than you were last year? Oh, I think because there's less traffic coming off the back, I think it would be natural to assume that so that you is take the case. that extra yeah. acreage and keep um, But once again, the, the density's moved from one area of the ground to the other. So the goal scoring is probably not going to be any different, I feel, but if you do get that nice run out of you know, out of the centre square and then kick it, kick it inside 50. Yeah. So. I want to throw Lee Matthews. I had a really good, I had an interesting idea, and I don't think it's a stupid idea. He said, instead of having six forwards and six defenders and only one wingman each, why don't we drag someone from there and someone from there where the ground's fatter, uh, make it only five on five, five on five, and put extras at the centre of the ground where the ground is fatter. Now, 
people going, ha, ah, that's stupid. I was listening to him. You know, he's really convincing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Lee Matthews. Him anything. Well, I'm sitting there, I'm on the radio, I was listening on the radio, I think, geez, that's not a bad idea. That just to open up the grounds at both ends. What do you let, think? We'll let you ruminate on that. We're out of time. <laughs> you having a go at Lee Matthews? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> not brave enough He for watches that. the show. Lee, he's having a go at you, Jerry. Uh, Damien, thanks for coming in. <laughs> Pleasure, guys. Chris, good to have you back. Thank Chris you. Scott and Damien Hardwick on AFL 360. Tomorrow night, our players. So Jack will be here. Jordan, who ended up missing the opening round with a hamstring complaint, will find out more from the man himself as Players Night comes back on 360.